record. We are live on Facebook. We are recording. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Councillor Glenn Gower, and I want to welcome everyone to tonight's presentation about coyotes. Um, every night I take a walk around my neighborhood, usually around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And on two nights last week, I saw a coyote running right down my street on uh, in the Fairwinds area. And uh, so I know coyotes aren't about, and we've been getting a lot of uh, emails and inquiries over the past few weeks from residents about uh, what to do. Uh, do. Do coyotes uh, pose a risk? Uh, how can we coexist with coyotes? So we've invited Nick Stowe, who's uh, uh, a, a, well, I'll let you introduce yourself, Nick. Nick, can you tell us? I don't want to do all the talking here, but welcome, Nick. Um, Nick is the go-to person at the city when we have a question about coyotes or other wildlife or nature issues. But Nick, maybe if you could introduce yourself to get, kick things off. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm Nick Stowe. I'm uh, the senior planner in the Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Unit at the City of Ottawa. Uh, I'm a planner by title, but I'm an ecologist, uh, a biologist by profession. Uh, I have a PhD in ecology from the University of Ottawa. Um, I've been working in, uh, in the field for more than 25 years and, and hiking in the field since I was 15 years old um, and uh, very well acquainted with coyotes, also very well acquainted with Stittsville and uh, uh, the Stittsville area and the area, natural areas of Stittsville where uh, we do find coyotes. So what we're going to do tonight is uh, Nick's going to give us a, a, a brief uh, chat, a brief talk about uh, coyotes. And then um, we can take questions from anyone who's tuned in. So if you're watching on Zoom, there's a Q&A button on your screen and you can type in any questions that you have for Nick and uh, we'll, we'll ask those. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you can type in a question in the comments section and we'll try to get to as many comments as we can over the course of the hour that we have here today. So without further ado, Nick, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and uh, looking forward to hearing, hearing your uh, your thoughts and ideas and advice on coyotes in uh, the Stittsville area. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, Councillor, um, and welcome to, to everyone who's listening in. Uh, coyotes, uh, uh, the issue of coyotes comes up a lot uh, in the city of Ottawa, particularly this time of year when coyotes are, are most obvious. But the first thing to know about coyotes is that they are found in every part of the city. We have them in the downtown, we have them in our suburban communities, and we have them in the rural area. They are ubiquitous. So uh, I, I live in Sandy Hill and uh, about a five minute walk from the Rideau River. And when I go down uh, for a walk in, you know, in the morning, in the afternoon, um, I can always see coyote tracks uh, in the fresh snow down uh, right in the, in the Rideau River Valley. Uh, through the heart of, uh, of the urban area. Um, coyotes are very well adapted to the urban environment and urban coyotes have actually been very well studied. Um, the, uh, probably the best research has been done <clears throat> at the University of Chicago by a fellow named Dr. Stan Garrett. Uh, he's been studying urban coyotes there for more than 20 years with his graduate students. And we've actually had uh, Dr. Garrett up to speak in Ottawa at our wildlife speaker series on two occasions. Uh, he was the first speaker we had uh, to open up our series back in 2014. And he was our most recent speaker this autumn in, in 2020. Um, so coyotes are found in every single part of the city. And uh, we normally don't see coyotes. Uh, they are very shy for the most part. Uh, they avoid human contact. They will, uh, you'll, if you do see them, you'll normally encounter them as the counselor did uh, in the evening or in the early morning. Um, so sort of those between hours when they're headed back to their den or they're just coming out to, uh, uh, to uh, prowl their territory. Um, they're seen most often in the winter months and there's several reasons for that. The first is that Obviously, we have less vegetation cover, and coyotes make their dens. They hide up during the day in densely vegetated areas, so thickets and brambles and heavy vegetation where we normally can't see them and where we might pass within five, 10 meters of them and not even know that they were there. 
In the wintertime, there's less vegetation, so we tend to see them a lot more often. Um, the, uh, uh, this time of year, uh, February, January, February through to March, is, is also mating time for coyotes. And so they tend to gather in larger groups. They're a lot more vocal. Uh, they are, uh, Dr. Garrett refers to them as a very romantic animal because the, the peak of their breeding season is actually Valentine's Day, February 13th. Um, and so uh, they're a lot more visible this time of year because they're out uh, meeting and greeting. Um, and they also tend to gather in bigger bigger packs in the wintertime. They disperse a little more in the, in the summertime, but they come together in the larger packs in, in the wintertime. Uh, the coyotes we see here, you'll hear people refer to coy wolves, coy dogs, eastern coyote. They're all pretty interchangeable. Um, coyotes historically were a western species. Um, they have, ex over the last hundred years, they have expanded their range eastward into eastern Canada, also further north and, and further down south. And as they expanded, they interbred with wolves. And so the coyotes that we get here in the Ottawa area and throughout Eastern uh, North America are a hybrid. They're, they are a coyote wolf hybrid. The amount of wolf in them in, in varies. Um, but uh, the, uh, consequently, they tend to be a little, a little larger. Their behavior is a little bit different. Um, but at heart, they are, they are still coyotes. Uh, now, when we talk about coyotes and our relationship with them, it's important for us to understand the difference between hazard on one hand and risk on the other. So what is a hazard and what is a risk? A hazard is anything that can cause you harm. So lightning is a great example. If you get struck by lightning, it may well kill you. Um, it is definitely a hazard. Risk, on the other hand, the risk of getting struck by lightning is very, very low. And if you manage your behavior, you can effectively reduce your risk of being struck by lightning to zero. And the same is true for coyotes. Coyotes are a hazard. So they are a medium-sized predator. Uh, they will prey on animals up to the size of humans, um, and there are well-documented cases of attacks on humans with a couple of fatalities known over the last, the last 50 years, the most recent of which was, uh, the most recent of which I recall was the, uh, was the woman who was uh, killed in Cape Breton a, a few years ago. Um, predatory attacks do focus on, generally focus on smaller stature people. So uh, smaller women, children, uh, you know, that's, if, if they're gonna be attacked, it's, it's more likely to be on them. Um, most predatory attacks occur adjacent to or actually on, on residences. So coyotes absolutely are a hazard, but the risk from a coyote is very, 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 very low. So uh, one of the studies uh, that Stan Garrett and his uh, students did and, uh, was they looked back over 46 years of records of attacks in North America. And over that 46 year period, they could only find 142 verified attacks of coyotes on people of which uh, only two were fatal. So that's, that's 142 attacks over 46 years. In comparison, each year in North America, there are 500 injuries and about 50 deaths from lightning. Um, there are uh, about 500, sorry, about 5 million injuries and 50 deaths a year from attacks by domestic animals. So the risk of injury uh, from a coyote attack is about a thousand times less than the risk of injury 
sorry, the risk, yeah, the risk of injury from a, a coyote attack is about a thousand times less than the risk of injury from lightning. Um, so yes, they're a hazard, but the actual risk is extremely low. And it's a risk that can easily be managed. So uh, what then can we do to, to reduce the risk uh, of attacks by coyotes and injuries by coyotes? Most attacks occur by animals that have lost their fear of humans. Uh, they've become what we call habituated to humans. And that is almost always a result of feeding of coyotes, uh, either deliberate or inadvertent. So there are, um, believe it or not, some people who will actually feed coyotes deliberately. They'll throw meat scraps and other food you know, into their backyard or behind their backyard and deliberately feed the coyotes. The coyote that's being fed like that is very, very quickly going to lose its fear and is going to associate houses with food sources. Um, but there's also a lot of people who are feeding coyotes and they may not even realize it. So if you have a, a pet and an unfenced yard and you happen to, you know, you, you've got a dog, you put him on a, a, a leash or a run outside and you put his food outside, it's a very good chance that you might also be feeding coyotes or other wildlife. They'll come into the yard and they'll, when the dog's not there, and they'll, they'll feed on the dog food. Um, coyotes eat a lot of fruit. Um, and if you have an apple tree in your backyard, or if there's a, an old abandoned apple orchard in the, in the brush behind your house, um, the coyotes will cut, and they're, down, they're downed apples in fall, windfall fruit, the coyotes will come and they will feed on, on that downed fruit. They'll even come in the middle of winter and dig down through the snow to get to that downed fruit when there's, there's no other source. Um, if you're throwing meat scraps into your comp, if you've got a, a compost uh, in your backyard, if you're not using a bin and you're throwing meat scraps out there, then you're likely to be attracting, uh, the chance you may attract coyotes. You'll also be attracting the animals that coyotes prey on. So you may be attracting mice and rats and things. And mat, uh, small mammals are, of course, the main, uh, the main prey of coyotes. Uh, that's one of their benefits for us is that they tend to keep the uh, populations of these animals under control. So the first thing we can do to you know, protect ourselves from coyotes is not to feed them. If you're doing it, Deliberately, please stop. Uh, what you're doing is harmful to the coyotes and ultimately is gonna to lead to a bad consequence for them. Um, and make sure that your garbage and your compost are secure. If you happen to have a fruit tree or even fruit bushes, raspberries, blackberries in your backyard, um, make sure that you clean up any windfall fruit. Um, and uh, if, you're, if your home backs onto a natural area uh, and you have uh, pets or children who are in the backyard, it's always wise to have a, a good, secure, and well-maintained fence in your backyard. Lots of reasons for doing that. Coyotes would just be one of them. So that's the first thing we can do, reduce the risk from coyotes. Let's not feed them. If we don't feed them, they're very unlikely to become habituated to us and uh, it's going to be better for us and better for them. The other thing we can do is if we're, when we're walking our pets, our, walking our dogs in natural areas or semi-natural or areas, keep your dog, keep the dogs on a leash. So dog and coyote interactions can occur at any time of year. Um, coyotes absolutely will see or may see a small dog as potential prey. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, but this time of year, if you're walking around this time of year, when female coyotes are out, you nail a dog up scent and decides to rush, that dog is likely to run into the mate of that female coyote. And there's going to be a conflict there. In the summertime, if you're walking your dog through an area, 
Remember, you will, you know, the uh, coyotes will den in these in the brush in these natural areas and thickets and so on. You may not even be aware that a den is there. You're walking along, your dog goes off the leash. If he dashes into that that brush and there happens to be a den there and there happen to be pups there, then of course the coyotes are going to defend their defend their uh, den against uh, against your dog. So very important if you want to minimize the risk from coyote conflicts uh, when you're out walking your dog keep your dog on leash unless you're in a designated off-leash dog area um, so on so that's how you can reduce the risk if you do run into uh, a coyote then be aware that um, of what normal coyote behavior is. They're curious animals. If you see a coyote out on the street, um, typically they will turn around and trot off, uh, usually to the nearest natural area, but usually in the opposite direction. Um, uh, but you know, they, they're curious too. So they might stop and look around and eye you and just see who you are and are you a threat. Um, a coyote that pauses like that stops to look at you, that is not an aggressive animal. That's not an animal that's acting aggressively. Um, sometimes you will see a coyote trotting toward you. Uh, that coyote may be retreating from someone else and may not have noticed you yet. And when it does notice you, it will probably look around for the nearest route to get out. Um, that again is not an aggressive animal. An animal that is taking shelter under bushes in your backyard, not an aggressive animal. Um, but uh, in the case of animals in your backyard, you definitely do want to dissuade them from uh, feeling comfortable there. And that's where we talk about hazing animals, hazing coyotes. Uh, it can be on the street, it can be in your, when they're in your backyard. If you happen to see a coyote in your backyard, even if it's just sleeping comfortably under you, under you know your blackberry uh, bushes, um, and you think it's kind of cute, it's still best to convince a coyote that's not the place to stay. So, you know, get out a couple of pans uh, from your kitchen cupboard, step out your back door, and start smashing them together. Make as much noise as you can, scare that coyote out of the, out of the yard. You don't want it getting uh, accustomed to to being in your yard. Um, same on, a, on the street, uh, you know, when that coyote is, is trotting, trotting towards you because it may have been spooked by someone else, start shouting. Clap your hands together, wave your hands, jump up and down, make yourself look as big as possible. You don't want that coyote thinking of you as anything but something scary. Um, if you do see an animal that is undeniably aggressive, then uh, you react the same way you would react if there was a big aggressive off-leash dog, which frankly you're much more likely to run into than an aggressive coyote. Um, same rules apply, shout, scream, stomp your feet, wave your hands, throw things at it. Um, and in the incredibly unlikely event that uh, a coyote were to attack, you don't run, uh, you fight back. And always remember you're much bigger than the coyote is. Um, and generally, uh, predatory animals aren't going to press an attack against some, someone that is larger than them and is fighting back. So, uh, and if you do see a coyote reacting aggressively and you have your cell phone with you, call 911. The police will respond to reports of aggressive coyotes. If you have, uh, if you get back to the house um, and make your phone call from there, the police will come out and respond to an animal that is, that is being aggressive. Um, now, for non-aggressive animals, uh, which is 99% of the, of the uh, well, more than 99% of the coyotes, uh, the city, the province, the conservation authority, or sorry, the, uh, the National Capital Commission, we will not respond to calls about coyotes unless it is an aggressive animal. Um, and the reason is that 
frankly, the risk is, is incredibly low. Um, but also because there's very little that, that we can do uh, to manage coyotes and very little reason for us to do so. Um, the, during the period when, and this kind of gets back into kind of the history of it, during the period when coyotes were expanding eastward from Western North America into Eastern North America, a rapid expansion throughout the whole continent, that was also the period when there was the most coyote management, the, the main coyote management programs occurring in North America. Many places in North America had bounties on coyotes, some places still do. And uh, despite that, despite some very intensive programs and bounties and hunting, um, coyotes prospered and continued to expand their range. And uh, the programs basically had little or no impact on their populations at all. Uh, coyotes are an extremely resilient and adaptable uh, species. Um, they're very difficult to trap. They're very difficult to hunt. Uh, they're very wary. And they will actually change their reproduction rate in response to, uh, to population pressure. So if the population declines, they'll have larger, larger litters of pups. Um, it's just kind of a natural response of the population. The greater the food source, the greater their, their numbers of, of litters. Um, so they respond to any kind of management pressure very, very quickly. Uh, the other reason that we don't respond to um, coyotes generally and try to manage them is if we remove a coyote or a pack of coyotes from an area, the animals in the surrounding area will immediately move to, to fill in that, that hole in the, in, in the range. They'll immediately occupy that area. Um, Every suitable habitat in Ottawa uh, for, for coyotes has coyotes in it. <laughs> and they're territorial. So they will, just like your dog, they will, they will mark their territory. And so every, every animal, every pack knows the territory of, of the animals in the pack around it. You remove an animal from a territory, it stops marking it, the surrounding animals immediately will move, will move to fill in that. So, Removing an animal has, removing or, or an animal or a pack has, has really no, no impact. Um, coyotes will, will be there the next winter. Uh, the, uh, the other thing you should know is that nobody traps and relocates coyotes. Uh, the, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry will not give you a permit to do so, and a permit is required. And um, the, uh, the, the reason they do that is that anytime you, you move an animal from one location to another, uh, you, risk the, you run the risk of, of transmitting a disease from one area to another area. Um, the uh, second, second reason is that um, uh, coyotes are, as we've discussed, territorial. So, if you try to trap and relocate a coyote, well, you're relocating it into some other animal's territory. And so you're just promoting conflict between animals. And so one of those animals is going to get displaced and, and killed in any event. Um, so, you know, we don't trap and, and re relocate coyotes. If it becomes necessary to manage a problem coyote, uh, then the coyote will be uh, will be destroyed. Um, it'll be trapped and killed or it'll just be hunted. Um, in my 10 years at the city, I know of two instances where we have uh, either we or the conservation authority has gone in to remove an animal. We've either hired a trapper or the conservation, or it's not the conservation authority, sorry. The National Capital Commission has sent out one of its conservation officers. In both cases, the animals involved were uh, diseased. Uh, in one case, it was very, very bad mange, um, and uh, the coyote was unlikely to survive because of that. And in the other, the other case, more recently in the Crystal Beach, Britannia area, there was an animal that was apparently suffering from distemper, 
and um, was because it was so sick it was not uh, uh, it was not seeking cover anymore. It was, it was out in the open. So those are the only two instances I know in in Ottawa where uh, we have had to remove an animal. Um, there have been uh, over the last ten years two incidents I know of where we've had reported uh, uh, attacks or aggressive behavior by, by coyotes. Um, in both uh, uh, in both cases, no one was uh, no one was seriously injured. Um, and keep in mind that we're talking here about a population in a population of a million people over ten years. We've had two reported incidents. So uh, again, very very. Uh, low risk of, of anything happening. Um, I'm just pulling up my notes here to make sure I haven't missed anything. So um, the other thing we want to remember about coyotes is that they do have benefits. So it's funny, coincidentally, I I got a call or a, a, an email forwarded to me last week from the Stittsville area um, about uh, concerns over the number of mice that we are are seeing. <laughs> In, in the neighborhood now. Um, I don't know what the situation with, with mice is in, in Stittsville. I have not been tracking that myself, but you know, mice populations go up and down based on a whole bunch of, of factors. And, and we have you know, a half dozen species of mice and voles and shrews that we'll, we get in the area. Um, coyotes, prey on mice and voles and rats. They will prey on turkeys. Um, and they do serve an, uh, a very important role in helping manage the populations of these pests. So that's one of the benefits that they provide to us. Um, and that's, that's good in a number of ways. I mean, you know, uh, mice, if they get into your house, can be a nuisance, of course. Um, but uh, mice and voles and shrews are also one of the hosts for uh, the tick that carries Lyme disease. And so by managing the populations of rodents, coyotes and also foxes and fishers and, and all the other uh, wildlife we find in the city, um, they help manage the risk of Lyme disease for us. So they do serve that, that benefit. Um, I think that's about I think that's about it. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions and I will refer, uh, I see that uh, someone had put the, the link up to our, uh, our coyote talk from this past, uh, this past autumn by Dr. Garrett. That's a um, very interesting talk. It, the talk itself is about an hour and there's a question and answer period after. Um, the talk starts about four minutes into the, into the YouTube video and I, I highly recommend it. He goes into a lot more depth uh, than I do, and obviously has a much uh, greater knowledge of uh, coyotes and uh, their habits than I do. Yeah, thanks, Nick. This is really good info, and I'm learning a lot tonight about uh, about coyotes. I want to remind folks that you can use the Q and A panel if you have a question, and um, I think we're going to try to do this like a uh, you know like a call-in radio program and see if we can get uh, folks to ask their question live. The, the first one, first question is from Craig. Now, bear with me here. Um, oh, you know what, Craig? I can actually. All right, I've always we've always wanted to try this out. So this, we're all kind of guinea pigs here. Craig, I'm going to allow you to talk if you want to ask your question directly to Nick. You might have to unmute yourself, Craig. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, yes. Craig. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Nick. For the presentation, great. Um, so in my case, I have a small dog, a small Maltese um, that I walk on leash. And so the first part of the question is, um, how likely is it coyotes would attack such a dog? But it's highly unlikely that they'll uh, attack such a dog uh, as long as it's on leash. Um, if you let it on leash, off leash, then uh, particularly in an area, you know, a natural area where sight lines are bad and uh, coyote may be uh, may be hidden. Of course, the risk is much much greater. Um, yeah, it, you know, you're you're really the deterrent in that in that case. Um, right. So, uh, coyote approaching your dog is also approaching you, which uh, they're very very unlikely to do. 
Um, you know, occasionally we'll, we'll hear reports of, of coyotes approaching small dogs. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I even heard of uh, one small dog on leash being injured. Um, I don't know the circumstances in that case, but I strongly suspect that, that someone walking in the area had been feeding the coyotes and that was probably what had attracted them in that case. But the risk to you, to your, your dog, when you're walking it on leash is, is very, very small. And then the second part, if they did take a mind to do it, um, how would they move in? Would they come in quite sort of step by step or move in quickly? Well, coyotes, oddly enough, are not really ambush predators, like uh, in my experience. So I, I can't speak for every case, but, um, you know, they're not ambush predators like, you know, a cougar would be out west. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you usually have a, a sign. They're usually visible when they're, when they're approaching. Um, now, if you're, if you're in thick brush, uh, a narrow path through thick mm -hmm. brush, it might be, you might not see them until uh, the last minute. But, but typically, you know, you will notice them coming and you will have an opportunity to you know, shout and scream and throw rocks, yeah, yeah. Pick, pick your dog up. Your dog is small enough to pick up. Um, yeah. So I, that's, you know, that's been my experience with most coyotes. I've seen them well in advance uh, or I haven't seen them at all um, because they have remained hidden. <laughs> Super helpful. Thanks a lot, Craig, for your questions. I'm um, going to go to a question from Ricardo. So Ricardo, if uh, you want to ask your question, you should be, if you unmute, you'll be able to ask your question here. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Yes. Okay, so uh, we have uh, our backyard faces a uh, creek where we've seen coyotes at least twice. And they are not aggressive, they just ran away when we make some noise. Uh, but we do have a 20 pound Westie dog. Right. Um, and a six foot uh, chain fence between okay. the backyard and the creek. I know that can, coyotes can easily jump that fence and either, even taller fences. But the question is, would they do it in order to prey on our dog? Uh, so my... Uh... Uh, I can't say they would never scale a fence to come <laughs> uh, to get into the into the backyard. As you notice, six, a, a, a coyote is probably capable of getting over uh, a six foot uh, a six foot fence. Um, but my opinion, the the chance of them doing so is extremely low. Um, once they come into your yard over that fence, they've left any cover. And that's one thing they don't like to do. Uh, they're also then trapped against the fence. And that's, you know, uh, they like to have a, a means of escape. So both of those factors, um, uh, both of those factors sort of suggest to me that they're very, very unlikely to come into, into your, your, your yard after your dog. And, and it's not, uh, I've never heard of that, that happening, certainly not locally. Uh, the other question is, uh, my dog actually saw one of them when mm -hmm. they were walking by the creek and he became very aggressive, like barking like crazy. Yeah. Would that, like for them, be like a, a territorial communication that that backyard now belongs to someone else? I suspect that would be the case. Um, I can't, you know, I can't read the minds of coyotes or Westies. Uh, my mother actually has, has two Westies. Um, I'm familiar with them and their Westies themselves are pretty territorial, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pretty territorial little things. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's how they would likely interpret that. Um, and certainly a, a dog like a Westie that's got some aggression to it, I think is going to be a little more of a deterrence. But, but nonetheless, the, uh, you know, a coyote is uh, certainly capable of preying on a Westie. So I think, you know, keep your, keep your fence well maintained. Um, uh, you know, keep it clear of anything that any area where uh, a coyote could hide out of sight. Don't mean trim back your, you know, get rid of all your flowers and vegetation, but at least keep the sight lines clear to the fence. And I think you're going to be, you're going to be fine. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.
Thank you, Ricardo, for your question. Um, we're going to go next to uh, Karen. So, Karen, let me. Uh, uh, you'll have to unmute there. But, Karen, are you joining us from New York, Karen? I am. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, we can. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I am. We have um, coyote sightings in Central Park here, a very yes. high rent district off Fifth Avenue. And we've had some also uh, one a couple of years ago that. It was running along the West Side Highway, and um, you have to call in experts to make sure it's not a dog and is indeed a coyote. So my question is basically like, um, I know they're upstate, but like how far do they actually roam to, you know, find new territories since to get to New York, they kind of have to go, I don't know, like across the Hudson River to kind of get to the island of Manhattan? They, they're remarkably adaptable. Uh, uh, creatures um, and extremely well adapted to an, an urban environment. So um, uh, Dr. Garrett from the University of Chicago, you know, he has, uh, he has video, nighttime video of coyotes um, right down along the lakeshore, you know, heavily developed lakeshore in Chicago that are so attuned to the urban environment that they know to wait for the traffic before they cross the road. Um, so <laughs> they, they can cross through urban areas. They'll do so at night when there's less, uh, uh, when there are less, less people out and they'll keep, you know, they'll keep to the shadows, but they will cross through a highly urbanized uh, environment. Um, you know, they'll go anywhere they can get, uh, they can get food in the urban environment. They'll typically build a den in a, um, you know, in a in a natural area or a semi-natural area. Where they're hidden from sight. So, uh, in a more urban environment, it would not be uh, out of the question that they might build their den, for instance, under an abandoned warehouse or, um, you know, some some construction waste at, a, at an old uh, construction site. Typically, in the Ottawa area, we have. Uh, you know, a, a high quality urban green space network that they, they build their dens there, but, but really they, they are adapted to almost any kind of urban environment. And that's how they've managed to get to, you know, get to Central Park. Mm, thank you. I'll just add, they make the front page of the newspapers when they're found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Central Park Coyote has made the newspaper here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay, I um, have a question here from, uh, from Mark about koi wolves. Can you talk about uh, koi wolves? And his question is, uh, how likely are coyotes to hunt outdoor cats? So two questions, one about koi wolves, one about hunting cats. So, um, well, all of the coyotes in, uh, in the Ottawa area are so-called koi wolves. That is, they have all uh, hybridized with eastern coyotes. Um, so the eastern, the eastern coyote, or sorry, eastern wolves. The eastern coyote is is a hybrid. It's a little bit larger than uh, its uh, its western, you know, the, the subspecies. So um, they're all hybridized with wolves. Um, there may be some that may have some impacts on their on their behavior. Um, but we really don't, you know, it hasn't been well studied enough. Um, sorry, what was the second part of that question? Uh, the second part was about uh, cats. And oh, cats, yes. Uh, so, yeah, oh, coyotes, if, you're, if you let your cat outside, um, I'm sorry to say, but you are very likely shortening the life of your cat for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, coyotes will prey on cats. Uh, so will uh, fishers, so will owls, um, so will foxes, uh, you know, and that's not to start counting the risk from, you know, traffic on the street. So yeah, coyotes will, will prey on, on cats if they, if they get the opportunity. Um, and uh, I, that's another good reason to, to keep your cats indoors. Um, as well as I should say, cats are, of course, one of the main predators of, of songbirds. And so if you value the songbirds in your backyard uh, or the rabbits, 
then you might want to also keep your cat inside. All right, thanks, Mark, for your question. Uh, gonna go next to Karen. Karen, are you with us? Oh, I'm not sure if Karen's still with us. Well, Karen, I'll read Karen's question, which was, uh, she says she's only five foot two, and how would she protect herself and her 30 pound dog should they encounter an aggressive coyote? So, uh, the same way that you would protect yourself against a, an, off, an aggressive off-leash dog, you know? Um, I have never, uh, I used to walk my dog at, uh, at Sandy Hill Park, um, you know, a, a block and a half from my house. The only time my dog was ever attacked was by another off-leash dog at that, at that park. And um, the, uh, and it's the same, so it's the, the same way. Uh, you have to be, if you're confronting, uh, confronting an aggressive canine of any kind, uh, you don't turn and run. Um, you know, so if, a, if an aggressive dog uh, attacks you in the neighborhood park, you don't turn and run because that invites them to chase. Uh, you have to be big and loud. You jump up and down, you raise your arms, you shout, you throw things, you hit. Uh, all the things that you would do to, you know, that aggressive dog in your, in your neighborhood. Okay, thank you, Karen, for that question. And, and Steve had a very similar question, so I think that covers Steve's question as well. Uh, I, I will say I have two. Um, I have two granddaughters. Uh, one who's thirteen, the other who's ten. Um, the ten-year-old, in particular, quite small statured. Uh, they live out in the countryside. Uh, they get uh, they get turkeys in the backyard, and they get coyotes, uh, you know, in the fields around their house. And um, you know, just out of uh, caution. You know, I have, I've taught them how to react if they uh, were to be confronted by a coyote. It's the same thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even, even for my, even for the little one, you know, jump up and down, shout, throw rocks, throw sticks, you know. It's a good, good skills and good things to know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're going to go next to Roger. Roger. Hi, Roger. You may need to unmute there, Roger. Okay. Right. Yes. Hi, Roger. Is this Roger from Bylaw Services? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Roger Roger from Spitzville. We, we met a few times before. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Nick, for your presentation. Um, just to, just to um, uh, um, follow up on the, on the coyotes, but uh, also foxes. Uh, I, we noticed a, a fox uh, last, last fall who would regularly um, uh, come out into a parking lot on uh, Orville Street and mm -hmm. uh, would just sit in the middle of the parking lot and just scratch for hours on end. And it looked very, uh, very scrawny. So I'm just wondering if it was sick or should we have called someone, uh, you know? Uh, tough, tough question. It, it uh, you know, I don't, without having seen the animal, I don't know. Uh, if it was sick or not. Um, foxes are, are very common in, in the urban area. Um, maybe not quite as common as coyotes. Uh, coyotes do tend to, to drive away foxes if they get the chance mm -hmm. um, and will prey on foxes if they get the chance. Um, but, uh, but you will find foxes in very urbanized areas. Um, I'm assuming if you know the fox for whatever reason, probably did not feel itself threatened in the parking lot, probably because it had good sight lines and maybe it was simply sunning itself. Um, but I do, but that, your question about foxes reminded me that I did want to make a mention um, about rabies. And, um, you know, rabies is uh, one of, again, it's one of those, um, uh, potential hazards, but which in Ottawa is a very, very low risk hazard. Um, so uh, there are uh, really two kinds of rabies um, that you'll, you'll find. One is bat rabies, and the other is, uh, the other is rabies in, in, um, in 
uh, other mammals like raccoons and skunks and, and canines. There are actually two or three kinds of strains of coyotes or kind of rabies that will infect coyotes and, and raccoons and skunks and so on. Um, we have not had uh, a case of uh, rabies in a domestic animal or in a, uh, a coyote, a raccoon, a skunk in the Ottawa area for more than a decade. And I think it's more than 15 years at this point. Um, for a long time, uh, Ontario had actually, was actually free of, uh, of rabies altogether, but then we had a, a outbreak down in the Hamilton area, which is uh, proving a little persistent um, and hard to eradicate. Uh, but we still don't have any, any cases of, of uh, fox rabies or raccoon rabies in, in the Ottawa area. Um, so if you see an animal out, a, a coyote or a fox out during the daytime, um, and you think to yourself, rabies, extremely unlikely. Uh, as I say, we would, the, the province does a very good job of monitoring for, for rabies. Um, nonetheless, uh, if you ever do suffer a bite from a, a wild animal, from a, a fox, a raccoon, a, uh, a skunk, uh, whatever, that is something that you immediately want to get checked and, uh, and public health may or may not recommend uh, rabies vaccine just because it's always a wise thing to do. But, the, but uh, we're not, we don't know of any rabies in the Ottawa area. We haven't known of any rabies for the last, uh, last 10 years. I will just say bats are another question. So about 5% of bats carry rabies. Um, that's pretty persistent across the, across the population. Um, so if you, uh, where it most often arises is where someone had, finds a, a bat uh, in their bedroom. Uh, they wake up in the morning and find there's a bat uh, huddling up in the curtains in their bedroom or something like that. Um, in, the, in a case like that, if you ever find a, a bat in a sleeping area of the house, uh, you should go in and, and get the physician to check you over for, or your child or over for uh, a bite. Um, they're very difficult to see, but the physician will know what to look for. Thanks, Roger, for your question. And Nick, you're giving us all nightmares now about bats. Sorry about that. <laughs> Again, you know, when was the last time you heard of someone dying of rabies in, in, in Ottawa? I think in the last 10 years, there's been 20 years, there's been what, one rabies fatality in Canada? Oh, is that so, eh? That's, that's kind of, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanna go to, there's a Facebook question from John who asks, do coyotes reproduce more when they're hunted? Uh, yes, they, they will. Um, and that's been, that's been demonstrated. Um, when you reduce the population of, of coyotes through, through hunting, um, there is then more food available for those remaining coyotes and they will increase their litter size in response to a greater food supply. So they will expand, uh, okay. increase the reproductive rate to kind of fill that, fill that gap. Thanks, John, for that question. Uh, Carol has her hand up. So go to Carol with a question. Carol, can you unmute? Okay. Um... Thank you. Talking about, the, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Talking about the rabies, didn't I was in public health. So I remember going back 15, 20 years ago where they really went after the rabies, the fox population by uh, putting rabies vaccines around the forests, et cetera. Is yes. that why the rabies has been reduced so much? That's exactly what, uh, what has happened. So the, the province instituted a, uh, a, bait, a bait program. Um, and they would drop a uh, bait that had been inoculated with rabies vaccine uh, throughout areas where um, uh, rabies was found to be prevalent. And that, uh, that basically eliminated uh, rabies from Ontario for a number of years. Um, and then they continued to run monitoring programs along the border with the US. So uh, you will sometimes hear about uh, them doing a baiting program around the Cornwall area or the Brockville area because 
there has been a case of rabies across the border in the US. Um, so they, they do that proactively to prevent rabies from spreading back into the, the Ottawa area. Uh, there has been, in the last few years, the province has been battling an outbreak, I think it's a raccoon rabies down in, um, in the Hamilton area, which they believe was probably brought into Hamilton through you know, inadvertent transport of an infected animal. You know, a raccoon gets into a transport truck ends up in, in Ottawa and or in uh, Hamilton and suddenly we're you know, okay. facing, uh, facing rabies again. But the, the control program there is, is, you know, is proving very successful. So they're not redoing this all the time. It was done many years ago and it's- It's only targeted. So they've, they've got to the point now where they, only tar where they target it based upon uh, risk. So if there are cases reported in northern New York State, for example, then they'll do a baiting program along the St. Lawrence River to prevent it from spreading north into, into Canada. And they've been doing um, baiting programs around the Hamilton area for uh, about three or four years now. Um, it's a little more difficult when you're actually in the urban environment and it's, there's more urban environment there and that's where they're having a hard time uh, uh, you know, uh, which we're putting a little more tenacious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Carol, for your question. Um, let's go to Christine. You can unmute there, Christine, and ask your question. Hi, yeah, I, I'm just listening, actually. I don't have any questions, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, I saw your hand up there. That's yeah, okay. that was by accident, apologies. Um, well, we're almost at our hour. I mean, I'll, I'll do a last call if anyone has a question and wants to raise their hand or use the Q&A. I have a question for you, Nick. It's something people yes. mention a lot uh, when they're commenting about coyotes. What impact does new suburban development have on, on coyotes? I guess um, people often assume that with, say, new housing going up, that it forces coyotes out of their habitat and, and forces them into more uh, populated areas, or I guess if you could comment in general about, about if, if that's a major effect to why we're seeing more coyotes. Uh, I believe it probably is, but I don't think it's has to do with the displacement of coyotes as it is with the provision of new food sources. <laughs> so, um, you know, coyotes are not a forest creature. So when we, when we clear, they're, they're a an, a, traditionally a grassland species, which is why a grassland desert prairie species, which is why they were found out west. They spread east into Eastern North America when we opened up the land for agriculture, created you know, fields and, um, uh, and pasture land and created the kind of habitat that they're accustomed to, which is that open habitat. They're not, they're not a forest species. Um, they become an urban species because we've created this kind of a, a more open environment. You know, it's, it's a concrete prairie instead of a grassland prairie, but it's still kind of a more open, open space. And more important, we've provided them with, with food sources. So either inadvertent or deliberate, deliberate provision of food. Uh, and they've become very well adapted to our urban environment. So I don't think it's that we're displacing them and they're becoming more obvious when we uh, expand as we're providing more urban habitat for which they're very well adapted. The other, you know, the other species that's true for is raccoon. Uh, raccoon densities are much higher in urban areas than they are in uh, natural areas. And skunks, skunk population, you know, populations much higher in urban areas than they are in uh, rural areas. Um, because the habitat is so good for them. Um, what about populations of coyotes in Ottawa? Is any, does anyone track that? Do we know if they're getting larger or any change over the years? Uh, we, don't, we don't track uh, the population of coyotes, neither does the ministry or for that matter, the National Capital Commission. Um, what we do track is predatory attacks on domestic animals. So uh, the province runs a compensation program for farmers. Um, 
And when a, uh, an animal uh, like sheep is, is injured or killed by a coyote, uh, they can claim compensation from the province, provided they've taken necessary precautions beforehand. If they haven't fenced their property and they're not doing anything, well, they don't get compensated. But if they, if they uh, have taken precautions and the animal is predated by a coyote, then the province will compensate them. And the city administers that program. It's actually a fellow in my group, uh, uh, Ryan Thompson, who, who has been administering that on the city's behalf for, for a while. And we track uh, compensation under that program and it goes up and down. It varies from year to year. Uh, coyote populations tend to vary year to year uh, uh, in line with deer populations. Um, so if, if deer have had a bad winter, uh, and then, then the deer population declines, then shortly thereafter, the coyote population starts to decline. If we get a couple of very, very mild winters and deer populations start to climb again, then coyote populations generally start climbing. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here, but I have one more question for you. Um, you know, I, I mentioned at the start of this, I saw a coyote twice in the past week. And yeah. it's always a little moment of, of excitement and, and joy when you see wildlife in an urban environment. Uh, I've seen a, a bear before, I've seen deer, I've seen coyotes. Um, I know you spend a lot of time outside in the Ottawa area. What is the most, uh, what is the most exciting animal you've seen? Where, where have you been uh, just uh, surprised and delighted by a, a wildlife sighting around the Ottawa area? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> well, one of the one of the most uh, I'll give you two instances, one of which is quite sad. So um, you may recall several years ago we had the elk that showed up suddenly down by Le Breton Flats uh, there. Um, I, I'll tell you quite honestly, uh, my colleague Amy McPherson and I, uh, when we heard that report come in of an elk, we both went, ha, ah, not a chance. Someone's mistaken a deer for an elk. <laughs> and then subsequently discovered, no, it's, a, it's an elk. Um, that, that was probably the most interesting uh, observation in my time at the city. Unfortunately, of course, at the end of the day, they were not able to tranquilize the elk successfully, and so it ended up being, uh, being killed. Um, but for me, I think otters are the most exciting. I love otters and we get them in the Rideau River. Uh, even downtown, I've seen coyotes in the downtown, downtown reaches of the, of the Rideau River. Uh, they've been seen in, in uh, the, the Rideau Canal up by, uh, up by the walks. Um, and they're fascinating to watch. I just love watching, watching otters. There are, there, I've seen someone post photos of otters in a stormwater management pond in Jackson Trails. In yes. South. So we have them out here too. And of course we have lots of beavers along Pool Creek. Of course well. we do. Yeah. No, it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the great things about uh, Ottawa, but Stittsville in general, we are so close to nature and we have uh, the Pool Creek natural corridor that, that cuts right through the community from, uh, from one side to the other. And we're lucky to have uh, the opportunity to see wildlife up close. Sometimes it can be a little bit concerning. Sometimes it can uh, put us a little bit at unease, but uh, if we know how to coexist, if we know what the hazard and the risk are, we can, we can uh, approach that with the appropriate caution and, and take the right steps. Yeah. Um, I, thank you so much, Nick, for the presentation. It's always, uh, I always learn something when we get a chance to chat. And uh, I really appreciate all of the questions and the uh, kind comments from uh, residents who have tuned in this evening as well. Uh, we're going to share this later on on YouTube. So if you wanted to share it with any of your friends and neighbors, uh, please feel free to do so. Great. And uh, thanks again, Nick. I really appreciate it. Have a good night. My pleasure. I always enjoy these. Thank you, Counselor. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.